Welcome to the West Tonka Historical Society's program on schoolhouses in our West Tonka community. My name is Pam Myers, and I'll be your moderator for today's program. We will show some slides of our community's one-room schoolhouses. We'll begin with the log cabin. Youngsters of the early mound pioneers had an opportunity to attend school as early as 1858. Before a school building was built, school was held in any suitable place that could be found. In 1860, Mr. Gribble opened his log cabin home to daily classes, which were taught by Miss Celia Sturman. Peter Mitchell gave up his log home for school classes with Miss Emma Carmen as teacher. In 1863, Frank W. Halstead of Halstead's Bay petitioned to form the first school district number 85. The first mound school building was built of logs in section 13, just east of Lake Langdon. Originally, there were three sub-districts. The people had to organize and build their own schools, and this meant that taxes for schools had to be levied. The teacher's pay was $8 a month, and an additional $4 was paid the teacher if no family would take them in and they had to pay for their own food. By 1870, there were eight students in the log school. I've interviewed a number of local residents who attended our rural schools. Orville Cressy told me that his grandfather brought his family by ox cart to Mound in 1891 from Richfield, when Orville's dad was just six weeks old. Grandfather Cressy built a log cabin for the family home on the west edge of Dutch Lake. And Grandfather Cressy's brother, Ed, was a school teacher in the old log schoolhouse in Mound. Orville graduated from Mound Consolidated High School in 1932. This drawing of a log cabin school appeared in the 1924 high school yearbook, which was called the Minoway. In 1872, a red frame schoolhouse was built on an acre of land near the current site of the Mound Medical Clinic. The land was donated by a pioneer, a Mr. Parker. For a time, it was taught by a Mr. Rupp, who was vigorously opposed to any system of co-education. He seated the girls on one side of the room and the boys on the other side. I don't have a photo of the Red Schoolhouse. Uh, it was destroyed by fire in February 1884. And for a while, school was held in the old carpenter shop that was purchased by the Chapmans on the corner where the Phillips 66 service station later stood, uh, down at the corner of Bartlett and Commerce. After the fire, in 1885, a white frame school building, measuring 24 by 40, was built on the same site where the red schoolhouse had stood. Al Rogers taught classes there in 1894. It was remodeled in 1894 and made into two rooms. In 1895, J.F. Rader was the first teacher to write entries in a permanent record document. He listed 37 students between the ages of five and 21. So in these eight grades, there were 37 students for the one teacher. Average daily attendance was 21 students. Monthly wages for the teacher were up to $30. The first grade class in 1895 ranged in age from four years old to 10 years old. There were nine children. Their names were Ed Danielson, Anna Erickson, Isabel Neufuff, Jalmer Johnson, David Johnson, Frank Batdorf, Ruth Martinson, Hattie Nolan, and Tuya Anderson. In 1907, the building was sold to Mr. Bjerke and was rented by the school board until the, excuse me, until the construction of the first brick grade school. It was purchased by Father Francis Yeager for a Catholic church in April 1909. The building was moved to the site just north of the current Netka's apartment building. The first mass was held there June 9, 1909. This brick school building was constructed in 1907 on the same site where the white school and the red school had stood before. It was a four-room school. 
It was known to most students as the Red School, or the Red Brick School, or the Grade School. It was located south of the corner of Commerce and Church Street, on the east side of the street. This building housed grades one through eight. Enrollment varied, but at times there were 75 to 80 pupils in these grades. Later, three rooms were used for grades one through eight. The fourth room became a classroom for high school freshmen in 1915. There were 15 high school pupils and 15 fifth grade pupils housed in the same room. In those days, even the superintendent taught school. In 1915, District 85 consolidated with other school districts in the area, and pupils were transported to the Red Brick School from the Jackson School, the Ekstrom School, and the Spring Park School, as well as portions of Districts 87 and 84. After the high school was completed across the street, two older grade school boys would walk across the street to the high school kitchen and pick up the day's hot lunch in a bucket and bring it back to the grade school, walking from room to room with a ladle to ladle, ladle it into the students' cups. The basement of this building later became the home of Mound Middlecraft, the forerunner of Tonka Toys. And here we have a classroom scene from the brick building. On April 22, 1916, voters of the school district favored the issuance of bonds in the amount of $55,000 for the purpose of building and equipping the first high school building to be located on Linwood Boulevard at the corner of Commerce. In the fall of 1917, until this building was completed, Francis Hammer Augustine attended ninth grade classes above the dry goods store at the corner of Shoreline, County 15, and Commerce Boulevard, County 110, uh, later called the Long Pre Building. Ms. Chapman was her teacher. She enjoyed looking out of the window, watching all that was happening in downtown. She could be busy in home ec class and see who was walking up and down the sidewalk. She regularly saw Mrs. Yost, the druggist's wife, all dressed up and walking through town. Francis graduated in the class of 1921 uh, from Minneapolis since her family moved out of the Mount area after 10th grade. The high school building contained six classrooms for grades one through six and six classrooms for grades seven through 12 with a study hall, a library, and an area for home economics and shop and a combination gym auditorium. Mr. Lindahl, P.O. Kaler, and Will Kaler were appointed a committee to look over specifications for the new building, which was to be built of pressed brick. The brick company, however, sent the wrong brick. After much discussion, it was accepted as a substitute. Some of you may know that same issue occurred at the new high school that was built in 1972. The first consolidated high school graduating class in 1918 consisted of two seniors, Frida Weber and Lulu Seifert, who, the story goes, came from Minneapolis to go to school here as seniors just so that they could be the first graduates. Students who completed grades one through eight in country schools and wanted to continue to high school came to Mowen Consolidated High School from about a dozen schoolhouses in our community. We'll visit each of them briefly and learn more about them later. We'll start with Spring Park School. This wood frame school building was built in 1906. It was located on County 15 at Dunwoody in Spring Park. It had two classrooms with a center hallway and a folding partition between the two rooms. Some classes were held with the partition open and some classes were held separately. There was a basement where the children played when the weather discouraged outdoor recess. And in the early days of the outdoor privy, it was a novelty that this school's outhouse was a two-holer, different from the one-holer at most homes. Later bathrooms were added in the basement. By 1940, Spring Park children went to kindergarten in Mound with Miss Elizabeth Gardner and then returned to Spring Park for grades one through four. In grade five, they returned to the 1917 school building and continued there through high school. So the two rooms in Spring Park 
each contained two classes, first grade, second grade in one room, third grade, fourth grade in the other room. Do you remember some of these teachers' names? Mrs. Alden taught first grade. Mrs. Chirkland taught second grade. Then there was Mrs. Carr, later Mrs. Eukster, Miss Annie Palmer, and Miss Eva Lou Russell. Do those names ring a bell? This school building was closed in the 1960s and sold to Spring Park Village Council for $1, saving the school district $3,200 in demolition costs. The school building was moved to its present location on Warren Avenue and became the Village Hall. A brick school building was then built on the site of the Spring Park School, and it was named the Elizabeth Gardner School after this Mound teacher who had taught 30 years, teaching kindergarten and grade one from about 1921 until about 1951. The next school we'll visit is the Jackson School, District 83. It was located on the southwest corner of County Road 26 and County 110. Jackson School closed early, closed in the early years. Mildred Cranky Banks remembers going to the Jackson School. Uh, the log cabin was no longer there. It already had been rebuilt as a small white building when she attended it. And Jackson in 1914 or 15 consolidated with Mound, the Mound School District into District 85. Mildred remembered uh, uh, that on Highway 26, about four or five miles west of Jackson School was the Lee School. There was quite a bit of rivalry between these two schools and many contests were held and enjoyed by pupils. Mildred also remembered grades one through six stayed in the Jackson School and the rest were taken to the Mound School in a horse-drawn bus driven by Walter Magnuson. People always remember their school bus drivers' names. For the three-mile trip to Mound, she says, we had hot soapstones to keep our feet warm in cold weather. Uh, I don't have a photo of Jackson School. I'd love to find one. Our next school to visit is Ekstrom School, District 91. It was located on the northeast corner of County Road 19 and North Arm Drive. It was also called Saga Hill School, and it was called Swede School, since so many of the children were from Swedish families. Frances Hammer Augustine started school at the Ekstrom School when she was six years old in 1909. I interviewed her when she was 99 years old. She told me about how much she enjoyed school. Uh, we have a photo of the students in this school on the front step. Frances said she especially liked geography. She remembered when her class went to the chairs near the teacher's desk to recite. She got to draw the outline of the Great Lakes on the blackboard. She also remembered taking the school bus in the winter when runners would replace the wheels and the bus would take the shortcut across the lake to Mound. Our next school to visit is Armstrong School, District 81. It was located on County Road 90 in Independence. And it was a school building it was a school site from 1857 to 1949. The first teacher was Norman Shook in the first school year, 1857 to 58, and he taught in the home of William Lewis. The school district organized in 1858 and the old log school was put in. It measured 14 feet by 14 feet. This was soon replaced by a larger structure of hewed logs. Ed Allen was the first teacher in this school building. Then came Eva Underwood, Ella Coffin, Effie Woodward Merriman. Do those names ring a bell with you? Thomas Clark taught in the summer of 1878 while this frame building was being erected. Sylvanus Stinson oversaw the construction of the frame building that measured 26 by 44. Spelling bees and debates were part of the winter activities. George Hoisington and William Mills conducted singing schools. Fletcher Ingersoll, who had been valedictorian of his class at Yale University in 1859, began lyceums. In this 1890 photo, the teacher Maud McNeil Lewis 
is in the back row on the left. Now we'll go on to the Maple Plain School, District 61. This school building was located right on Highway 12 in Maple Plain. And this site had a school from 1894 to 1924. Originally it was this frame building. The teachers in this photo are James Personette and Lila Leck. Uh, later on, the uh, brick school building replaced the frame building, 1924. Uh, the next school that we'll visit, I don't have a photo of and would love to have one. This is the school that was at the Catholic Church, Saints Peter and Paul in Loretto. It opened in the early 1920s and Loretto's claim to fame as far as Mound Consolidated High School is concerned is that there were members of the Mound Consolidated High School state championship wrestling team that came from Loretto. Uh, that was in the early 50s that that wrestling team won the state championship. The next school I also don't have a photo of, Wagner School, District 80, originally located in Section 2 on the north side of County Road 11 in Independence. This was a low spot. Often the water surrounded the building like a moat. About 1910, a new building was built on a hill on the southwest corner of the intersection of Independence Road and County 11. It was in existence by 1880. In the early 1820s, after the new parochial school opened at Saints Peter and Paul Catholic Church, there weren't enough pupils left to keep Wagner's school open and it closed in 1921. Some of the early family names of Wagner school children were Wagners, Schumachers, Cook, Altendorfs, Clares, and Vanderhagens. Uh, our next school is Evergreen Grove School, District 102. It's located at County Road 11 in Independence. It was also called M McGarry School, and it was called the Poole School, since the Poole family had many children and they all went to school here. In 1892, a quarter acre of land was purchased for $10 and this school was built. In the 1920s, a full basement with a furnace and furnace room was built. Indoor toilets were installed about 1950. This building was sold to the City of Independence for $1. Uh, Evergreen Grove School consolidated with Delano School District in 1964. I understand this building is still standing. I don't have a current photo of it. Our next school building, also I don't have a photo of, Hitzman School, District 79, located on Hitzman Lane, which is old Highway 12. This school building was also called, the school district was also called Oakdale School. Uh, the next school I do have a photo of, Copeland School, District 82, located on the northwest corner of Copeland Road and Kuntz Crossing. It was also called the Raider School. Uh, this school uh, existed from 1869 to 1961, almost 100 years. District 82 was Copeland School, was organized March 27, 1869. Frank Coffin was the first teacher. He taught for three months at a salary of $35 a month, term ending December 1869. William F. Ingerson followed him, taught the winter term, 1870, $35 a month. Mrs. Lizzie Coffin taught the spring term, 1870, for $20 a month. I don't know about the disparity in pay there. The new frame schoolhouse in this photo was built in 1892 on the same site at a cost of $725. It still stood in 1979. You'll notice in the front yard here, uh, this girl is standing by the pump. So this was a lucky school site. They had water on their own site, didn't have to walk someplace else to get the water. There were still nine active one-room schools in Hennepin County as recently as 1958. And we have a newspaper article about Copeland School. 
1958, there were 10 pupils in Mrs. Bessie Zebarth's classes at Copeland School. Three of the students were in first grade, one in second, one in third, and five in fifth grade. All the fifth grade students are working at the blackboard in this photo. I noticed that there are only four people there. Maybe one was absent that day. We have a photo of the Copeland seesaw. So a little recreation activity there. The seesaw is set up between the trees. We have a photo of wa students washing their hands. Each of the pupils had a set of chores, such as pumping water by hand to do each day. And these chores, the students rotated these chores each month. And then we have a photo of the lonely trip. Our next school is Lindale School, District 126. It's located on County 6 at Kuntz Road in Independence. It was also known as North School. Lindale School was in place from 1892 to 1966. Early in the 1880s, school was held for a few months in a log cabin on the site of the present Earl Zoldan Farm. The schoolhouse in this photo was built in 1892 at a cost of $585. The first teacher earned $25 a month. In the early days, the school children bought their own books, brought their own chairs. Boards were nailed to the walls for the desk tops. A square box stove heated the school. School was not compulsory and children went whenever and as long as they wished to. Uh, Lindell School in 1959 had a new school building, newly renovated school building, which you see in this slide. Lindale School was one of the last one-room schools in Hennepin County. Laura Lorena Burmaster taught at Lindale School from 1946 to 1966, 20 years. Is that a name you know, Mrs. Burmaster? We have a photo of her classroom in 1963. Here she is, Mrs. Burmaster. And in this photo, which was taken at a reunion, uh, we have pictures of the person that was in her first first grade class and her last first grade class. This photo shows a classroom in 1963. And the next one shows the autographs. These are the names of the children who were in that classroom photo. You may know some of those names. Quas and Schrader. You may know some of those family names. Zoldan. This uh, school reunion was organized by four, fumer, four former students and attended by 75 former students and their families. Uh, today, the school site is still, uh, still has the building on it. It's been remodeled into a family home, but it still exists right there on the same corner. The next school we're going to visit is Lee School. District 84, located on County Road 26, south of Lindale. Lee School, uh, old school, there was an old school on the site, and it sold for $17.50 and was moved away from the site. So the original photo, that one was taken in 1902. A new school building was built on the same site for $600. An addition was added to this schoolhouse on the front, and it included a cloakroom, two bathrooms with running water, and a library room. Electricity was brought to this site by Wright County Rural Electric. Uh, Earl Taylor attended school in this school building, and he and his dad dug the basement in which they put the furnace. These are the basement rafters when the children had to stay inside for recess because of inclement weather. They played balls sometimes here. Can you see the shadow of the basketballs when they hit the ceiling? This is current. The remodeled schoolhouse is now a single family dwelling for Kevin and Stephanie Cleaver and their new baby. Mr. Cleaver teaches school in the Hopkins School District. 
Then we have a couple of schools, again, that I don't have photos of that I would love to have a photo of. The first one is St. Peter Lutheran School, located on County 92, just west of the Hennepin County line, and uh, was at St. Peter Lutheran Church, but I don't have a photo there, and I don't know anything more about that school. There also were two schools in St. Bonnie. There was St. Boniface Catholic School and St. Bonifacius Public School, both of them located in the St. Bonnie, the town of St. Bonnie. Uh, the public school was District 96, and uh, I recently connected with uh, folk in St. Bonnie with their historical society and might have some photos of that shortly. Uh, that concludes our program today. These are the sources that uh, I used to collect this information. Personal interviews with Mound Consolidated High School grads from the 1950s, 1940s, 1930s, and 1920s. The transcripts of these interviews have become part of the archives at the West Tonka Historical Society. I reviewed some issues of the Minnetonka Pilot, which preceded the Laker newspaper. And I read some of the book, Our Independence, 1854 to 1981, which was produced by the, the uh, independent, town of Independence. I also gathered some information at the Western Hennepin County Pioneer Museum, the Maple Plain Historical Museum, and from the, our local West Tonka Historical Society. I'd like to thank J.D. Brewstead for putting together the PowerPoint presentation for these slides. And if you have questions or more information about our schools to share or photos, which I sure am looking forward to, please give me a call, 952-474-1601, or email me at the address there that you can see on the screen. Welcome to the West Tonka Historical Society's program on schoolhouses in our community. My name is Pam Myers. I'm with the West Tonka Historical Society, and I'll be your moderator for today's program. We have a panel of four local grads who represent three of our schoolhouses. They'll share some of their memories with us. Our panelists are Earl Taylor, who attended Lee School graduated from Mound Consolidated High School, class of 1940. Alice kuntz who attended Lindale School and graduated from Mound Consolidated High School, class of 1936. Margaret Jorgensen Zoldan, also attending Lindale School, class of 1938 from Mound Consolidated High School. And Marvin Johnson, who attended Armstrong School and graduated from Orno, class of 1953. And we're gonna to start today with Earl. Earl? My name is Earl Taylor, and I live in the New Lendale City of Independence with, with my wife, Gladys, and uh, we've lived there for the past uh, 55 years. I was born and raised uh, on the farm in Minnesota and uh, Minnetrista Township, uh, Hennepin County, uh, just across the road from Lee School District 84, where I attended grades uh, one through eight. This was a one-room school with one teacher for all eighth grades. It was located a mile, about a mile south of New Lindale. It was on the south side of Hennepin County Road number 26, and it was uh, just west of, of Deer Creek Road. In doing some research for the, uh, on the history of schools and school districts, I, I come across some a very interesting information, I thought. Uh, I found that in 1849, the first Minnesota Territorial Legislature passed a law providing for the establishment of, pu of schools, public schools in Minnesota. And the first uh, Minnesota Legislature made provisions that Section uh, 16 and Section uh, 31 of each township be set aside for education. And then the money acquired from the sale of that property uh, was used for established schools, rural schools. Now for some history of uh, the Lee School. In 1870, uh, Frederick Matavy sold a half acre of land uh, to the Lee School District for $5, and then they, they built a school. 
And in 1894, the school was sold to Ed Lee for $17.50. And then they built a, a new school at that time. And they built a school then for $600. I acquired the treasurer's uh, book of records for Lee School of Records from 1901 to uh, through, uh, 18, 1891 through 1901. And uh, which I thought was quite interesting, this information regarding the, the finances of the uh, school district during that period. And the financial records show that for the year 1891, the receipts amounted to $286.69. And disbursements for the year, $301.80. That's for the entire year. And these monies came from the state uh, school fund, which included the liquor license fees and fines, and et cetera. And then there was a one, one mill tax at that time. The disbursements for the year 1891 were listed uh, as follows. This is for the entire year. Water, $1. Cleaning, $2. Teacher salary, $280. Building fires, $5. Dictionary supplies and clerk fees, $13.80 for a total of $301.80. <clears throat> this left the balance in the, uh, the treasure $68.49. They didn't really have a lot of money to work with at that time. I went through the records for the 10-year period and I picked out a few of the disbursements. Uh, in 1892, they spent uh, $3 for, for, uh, for the year to scrub to clean the schoolhouse. And in 1893, they paid $12 for plans for a new school that they built then in 1894. In 1894, they bought a bell, the school bell, for $24. In 1896, they paid $1 for one quart of basswood. And uh, the total expense for 1901, the teacher's salary is $245. Wood and school supplies, $36.30. Miscellaneous, $10.82. For total expense of $292.12. You compare that to uh, 1891, it's a 10 year period. There's only $10 difference, about $10. $9.68 difference in, in the disbursement from, from uh, 1891 to uh, 1901. And they still had a balance to treasure $156.63. <clears throat> the teacher salaries ranged in, in the, from $30 a month to $40 a month. In 1894, they built a, a storage. Uh, a woodshed building was attached to the rear of the school for $78.13. And in 1900, they dug a well. After 30 years, they finally dug a well. Before that, they, they uh, uh, paid for water from Ed Lee that they uh, right close. <clears throat> and Lee School closed in 1950, and uh, Bill Schilling, a farmer in uh, Minnetrista, then transported the students to the Lindale School, District 126, until 1961, when Lee School was consolidated with the Watertown School District at that time. And Lee School was sold at auction to Ed Hegman, and he sold it to John Riddler, and John Riddler remodeled into a home. Uh, some of the memories of attending uh, Lee School, school started at 9 o'clock in the morning, and it was out at the 4 o'clock. Fridays was out at 3.30, and Fridays we usually have to do some chores. We had to go outside and clap the racers, clap the chalk out, and uh, sweep the floor, and, and uh, wash the uh, chalkboards or the blackboards, and uh, sweep out the outdoor toilets. We had one hour for lunch, and we had uh, two recesses. <clears throat> the teacher rang the bell, it was time for school to start, and in the morning, and at noon, and recess, and every day the flag was put up and <coughs> taken down by some of the older s students. And the first thing after school started, we said the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. And over the year, the enrollment uh, varied from 18 to, to 30 students for all eighth grades. And most of the teachers were strict and they were in, in control. I don't recall there was ever a major discipline problem during my years in school. And the, school, the students would uh, go up to the front of the, of the room. And they sat on a long bench when it was their turn to have their lesson. I think it was a, a learning experience for the, uh, for the younger uh, students. They could listen while the older students were having their lesson. Maybe it was a refresher course for the older ones, too. They could listen in on the younger ones. And some of the things we were not supposed to do during school, and we didn't. We didn't chew gum during school. And uh, we didn't call the teacher by her first name. 
and there was no whispering or walking around during school. And I had five different teachers uh, during my eighth grades. Uh, Melvina Olson, and uh, I think she, she taught at Lindale probably, I think, too, no. later on. No. And uh, Myrtle Harrelson, Mildred Wells, Lucille McGraw, and, and Faye Jones. I don't recall the school was ever closed because of the cold weather. Sometimes it got 20 below or better. And uh, some of the children would have to walk as far as two miles to, to go to school. And on very cold days, sometimes their dad would bring them uh, to school in a wagon box on a bobsled with a team of horses. I remember the first days off in fall was when the teachers had their teachers' convention, they had a workshop, and, and that's when we usually have to dig potatoes at home on the farm, weather, depending on the weather. And Thanksgiving, we had Thursday and we had Friday off, and that's the time we would sell Christmas seals to, to raise funds for tuberculosis research. And I know I've walked to my uncle and the aunt, I have two of them, they lived about a mile south of our place in uh, Independence Township, and I would walk across the, through our woods and through the a little marsh to their place and they usually buy a dollar's worth of Christmas seals each and then they would have um, hot chocolate and coffee for me, uh, not coffee, hot chocolate and cookies, which was a real treat. We had a Christmas program which was uh, very special. The school would be packed for the program. We'd have <clears throat> recitation and we'd have uh, uh, sing uh, Christmas carols and exchange presents. And we look forward to Santa Claus coming. Uh, he would uh, hand out bags of candy and nuts and, and fruit. And that was a real treat. That's something we didn't have very much of at home at that time. <clears throat> and in spring, we had a week off for Easter vacation. And I think now they probably call that spring break. But then we called it Easter vacation. And we made May Day baskets uh, with flowers for May Day. And I have a picture of a May Day party that we had in 19, 1928. We no longer observe May Day as May Day because in 1958, May 1st of each year was designated as Loyalty Day by a Congressional Act. And the bill proclaimed May 1st of each year as Loyalty Day it was changed to counteract the Communists uh, who were using May Day as their annual hate demonstration day against the United States at that time. We look forward to Play Day, which was held late in the spring, was on a Friday, when Lee School met with other school districts, which included St. Bonnie and uh, Copeland and uh, and Lindale School, it did not always include all four schools at the same time. And we had a, a cleanup day, that was in the spring, we'd bring our, everybody would bring our rakes and uh, we'd clean up the schoolyard and then we'd have a wiener rose. And at the end of the year, we'd have a, a potluck picnic. The Hennepin County Superintendent would uh, come visit our school each year, and also the Hennepin County nurse, and she would visit, and we'd be tested for tuberculosis, and we'd have vaccinations and inoculations for, I think, with diphtheria, probably in smallpox. And uh, she tests for our vision and also our hearing. The school building was pretty much a traditional type building that they built at that time. They had a bell tower, had no basement, no electricity, no running water, no indoor toilets. The drinking water had to be pumped and carried in. And I think at that time they had a pail and they had a dipper because I seen in a record someplace where they bought a dipper and they bought a pail. <laughs> uh, there was a wood storage building attached to the back of the building in addition to the front of the building for a cloakroom and, and a storage room. There were two outdoor toilets in the back of the school building and in, in the front there was a hand pump, a flagpole. There was a large stove in the, the corner of the building with a, a jacket around it. <clears throat> And on the walls is a picture of uh, uh, President uh, George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, the World Globe, and an unabridged dictionary, had a set of encyclopedias, a map case, a clock, and I can remember there was a pencil sharpener on the wall, too. In the wintertime, it was real cold. The students, the students would put their dinner buckets and their overshoes around the, the stove to get warm. There was no heat to distribute. There was no uh, van to distribute the heat around. Uh, sometimes in the wintertime during our lunch hour, we'd go across the road to our farm and we'd go skiing, sliding, or tobogganing, and we had a real steep hill. I remember one time a girl slid down the hill on her sled, slid out on County Road 26. Car was coming, she slid underneath the car, and she never received a scratch, and that was a, a real miracle, but that stopped the sliding. No more sliding on that hill during the, uh, during the lunch hour. 
1936, the school was remodeled. I was 13 years old at that time, and my dad and I got the job of digging the basement. It was a walkout type basement. It was dug just a few feet uh, east of the original building. And the work was done with a plow and a pick and shovel and a scraper and a slusher and a lot of, a lot of hard work. Uh, it was a walkout, yeah, they said it was a walkout type basement, and uh, uh, it, was a t it was a woodshed, and my dad was given a woodshed uh, for his uh, wages to, uh, to dig that basement that was, uh, had been attached to the south end of that building. At the same time, an addition was built on the front of the building uh, for a cloakroom, it had two bathrooms, a library, and then they had a, a furnace in the basement. The toilets were chemical toilets, had a large holding tank, and they were not flush toilets, they were chemical toilets, and they didn't work out very well, and they didn't have them very long. They, they purchased more, more land, and uh, they installed a conventional type system after that. And I did not get attend the new remodel school as I was, uh, I started high school that time at, at, at the District uh, 85 in Mound. Uh, this concludes some of my memories of history and memories of, of uh, Lee School. And uh, I'd like to leave you this, this thought that I think the loss of a close neighborhood uh, came with the closing of the rural schools. Right, thank you. Well, I can't give all the history like Earl did about Lindale School because I don't know that much about it and I don't have anything to look at. But uh, uh, I know that my grandfather came down in, in 1904 and the school was built, I believe, in 1891. And uh, the land that he bought surrounded the, the school and uh, also, and it was a total of 80 acres, but the school was already built. and. Um, so that's why I guess the school had a special interest for, to me, but I can say, as Earl had told so many things about the country school, very much of that was the same in our school. I do think, I'm not positive, but I know in 1923, uh, electricity came past our house, and I think school, our school got electricity in 1923, and that was the year I started. And um, I, too, had uh, uh, several teachers, uh, Helen Nelson and Dolores Wetter and Irene Grassinger and uh, Edna McGowan and one of them stayed as many as four years while I was there and uh, and one of them only one year but um, when I think back to the short time you have with each child when you are in a one-room school isn't very much but I, I was just amazed that Helen Reen, the first teacher I had divided five of us kids in three groups because of our reading. <laughs> um, but uh, the rest of them, but then some classes we did, co they did combine, like sometimes language classes they would put together, like first and second or something in that order. And uh, uh, a special event that was always a big thing in our school, and you know, country school doesn't have much space, but the week before uh, the program, uh, men would come in and uh, put in some planks for a for a stage, and then they'd have some, we had some brown curtains that they pulled back and forth to so we could hide around the corners of the of the curtains and think nobody saw us, you know, but they would see us anyway. And uh, uh, so then from that week, well, first of all, the teacher had a big job, and I don't think people that never, never put on a program do not know all that goes into that. In those days, they didn't have anything to reprint uh, things with. We did have a, I don't know just how she did. I think we copied. She had some books and, and we had to copy our parts out of the book if we were in a play. But it, like Earl said, we had um, recitations and songs and it always seemed that we were, most of the time, I think we all had to get up on the stage no matter, um, what grade we were in and would sing songs together and then we'd have some plays and I think the older children uh, did the writing of the parts that the uh, other the smaller children had to say and then they had to take it home and learn their parts and at first we would uh, just uh, probably spend our English time 
practicing. Then later on, when the, after the stage was up and the, cla the, the uh, desks were all moved together, we didn't have time to really, um, we, I didn't, we didn't have time or the space because the, after, when the desks were put in, or when the stage was put in, that took a big bunch of our space. And uh, so we were, it was kind of hard for the teacher to conduct any, many classes. And so the last week when the, all this was done and ready for getting ready for the program, um, we practiced a good share of the day. And uh, so it was, we thought that was great because we didn't have to study for any lessons. And then the smaller children, to keep them busy, um, we didn't have all kinds of decorations for the Christmas tree. So we sat and, oh, we had probably just a piece of paper and we had to sit there and cut circles like this or something and they dangle down from the Christmas tree. And, uh, and we had a lot of ornaments on it, I know. And, uh, but then the big night, we, oh, we were all excited for the big night. And uh, people kept coming in and coming in. We didn't know where they were all going to sit. But they managed somehow to sit on top of the desks and in the desks and, and any, I had back in the, we had a library back in the corner. I think there was a place there they could sit. And, uh, but it was packed. They were just like a bunch of sardines in a can. So um, it was really tight. But somehow or other, we managed to get through the program. We were all excited. We came with our bib and tucker, the best bib and tucker we had. <laughs> and, uh, which in those days wasn't elaborate like it is today. And uh, so then we went, got through our program. And uh, of course then, no matter how full the church, the school was, the um, uh, Santa Claus managed to get through with his great big bag of goodies. And that was, that was the, well, the biggest part of the program. And uh, so when, when Santa Claus came, then everybody knew the program was over. And I'm sure the teacher gave a big sigh of relief because she had a lot of responsibility. And um, then we all got our candy. And as Earl said, we didn't get as much candy and nuts and things like that in those days. Um, and um, uh, anyway, the, then everybody managed to get out safely every night. Unfortunately, we didn't have any fire or anything. <laughs> Uh, so it was uh, a big night for us. And um, no matter what, whether it was good or not, the people clapped a lot. And <laughs> so we don't know, but everybody probably clapped a little extra for their own children. Um, and then, um, so, but it was just kind of a little letdown when we had to, uh, quote, when we, our program was over. But uh, I couldn't help but think too, as Earl was talking about the, um, school, how an important part it played in our life, because we did not have transportation like you have nowadays. We were lucky to have a radio, and I don't know if we even had any when I started school, but sometime during that time, we did start having radios. And um, of course, uh, some people didn't even have a car, so they couldn't go a lot of places. So our, really, the center of the whole thing was at our churches or our, our school. and. Um, uh, so it was most of our time, our free time, or good times, I should say, um, we spent either doing something at church or doing something at school. And that we were much more of a community fair. Now I hardly know my neighbors. But, um, and it is, I guess I didn't fail to mention that Lindale School is on County Road 6, right at the little town of Lindale, which is very much to brag about. But at that time, we did have a, we did have a creamery and a store and a, in the schoolhouse and a church. And uh, so those were, our, we were limited in the things that we could do. And, but then in the year, um, I don't know if Earl had it in their school with it, but I imagine he did because uh, when I was in the upper grades, they started sending out, Hennepin County started sending out two music teachers that came once a week. Did you have that time? Yes, we did too. Yeah, yes. well, anyway, um, I know, uh, a, a, it was help to the teacher because she got a little time to, to herself, at least one day a week. And uh, when you're with the kids every day, every hour of the day, it gets pretty filled up. Uh, your time is pretty well taken and you just wonder how you're going to get all through, through all, your cl all the classes. But she, our teachers all did a real good job, I thought. And as Earl said about their pay, I don't know what our teachers got paid, but uh, I think probably um, we, they did get somewhere under $100, I know that. 
Yeah, don't ours ever went down to 30 that I know of. <laughs> but uh, anyway, going back to this yeah. music teacher, that was a big event for us. And, and it just happened that I was in my upper grade. Uh, I think I was probably eighth grade. And uh, there was another music teacher, too. I think her name was Schmidt. I'm not sure of that. But anyway, they just decided that they were going to combine all the school kids from Edmond County and have this mass group for singing on the radio. And um, radio, you know, that was very uncommon then. And uh, so I was one of the lucky ones that got chosen, probably because I was eighth grade, not because I was a good singer. But I think she felt it was our last chance to go, so mm -hmm. most of us were eighth graders. But mm -hmm. there weren't too many, and I can't remember how many. But anyway, we got together with all these kids from all over Hennepin County and practiced. And then we had to go to this radio station. Well, getting to Minneapolis even was a big affair for us because we didn't get there very often. And so just to drive down there was great. And then to get in this off, in this radio station, it was my, my coming in here now because um, it was uh, not as fancy as this, I'll say that, but, but uh, it was real interesting to us to, and a good experience for us to see what really went on. And here we were talking to people or singing to people. We didn't even know how many, but maybe there weren't many, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, anyway, that was another highlight in my, um, my uh, years at Lindale. And uh, it brings back a lot of memories.